Okay, good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Tenille Elkins from APRA AMCOS in the uh, Perth office. And uh, thank you so much for coming along this morning. It's really lovely to have you all here and spend this time with us, um, this full day with us today. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're very fortunate to be gathering on today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So, as I mentioned, I'm the Rider Services Representative for APRA AMCOS. This is my 21st year with um, APRA AMCOS, so um, I might have a big 21st, maybe. Uh, oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's, it's my job to look after the near 9,000. We've got 9,000 members across Western Australia who are writing songs. Some will be performing, some might be you know, have their songs on the radio, it might be streaming, it could be one of those things, it could be a combination of those things. Um, and so, yeah, it's my job to, to have a chat with you folks, if you're members. Some of you might be songwriters or need to join up. It's free to, free to join up um, and fairly, you know, you can go on the APRA AMCOS website and sign up there um, or let us know if you need a hand with that and we can, we can give you a hand. Um, APRA AMCOS, it does confuse people sometimes, um, which is, you know, they are two different rights that they deal with. So APRA is all about the performing right in music. So when your works are play, performed live or broadcast on the radio or streamed or anything like that, that's the APRA side. And AMCOS is the reproduction right in the work. So when the songs are reproduced, the easiest way to think about that is if um, you know you've got a you make a recording and you make a couple of hundred CDs, that song has been reproduced all those times on those on those copies. Um, but it also includes you know uh, streaming as well, so it's getting reproduced all those times. So you might be a member of APRA, but not a member of AMCOS. So I'd, I'd encourage existing members um, to give us a call, get the app if you don't have the APRA AMCOS app. It's really great. Um, have it on your phone. You can register your songs on the go, put, report your performances, but you can also see your membership information and it'll show if you're an APRA member and an AMCOS, AMCOS member. If you're only APRA, it's really quick to sign up to AMCOS as well because um, you're in the app. So, you know, and you only have to register your songs work once and it all goes in together. But um, just something that catches a few people out, especially if you've been a member for a while and you joined up to APRA and um, your works weren't reproduced at that time, but now they might be getting streamed or something. So keep that in mind. Give me a call if you get stuck and want to know more. Welcome to this regional sessions um, for WA, presented by APRA AMCOS and proudly supported by the DLGSC, the Department of Local Government, Sports and Cultural Industries. This is our third stop on our five event tour of WA and um, we're really excited to be here with you all. So we've done Albany, Bustleton, we're now in Kalgoorlie, we're going to <laughs> Karatha on Thursday. So if you know any folks in Karatha or around that area who would benefit from this, please let them know to um, jump online, sign up, or you can come and chat to the staff here. And um, yeah, if there's anyone, there's still available spots up in Karatha. And um, finally, Broome as well. So that one's been pretty busy, but I think people can still sign up for that. So if you know anyone in Broome as well, um, let them know that they can still sign up for those, those two after this one. So we created the regional sessions as a high impact day to foster creativity, connections and industry knowledge at a crucial time for anyone pursuing their music. So, you know, obviously the last few years have been really hard with COVID and um, performances are back, but travel and touring is still quite difficult. Um, so this day is all about songwriting, um, networking, making connections and um, focusing on that and um, you know, bring it back to what it's all about, getting, getting those songs um, and having those connections with people as well. A little bit of housekeeping before we begin, we'll kick off shortly with our keynote presentation, followed by our panel discussion and then our workshop sessions this afternoon. You'll find the event timings for today on posters around the venue. So there's one just on that 
store at the back if you're not sure about any times. You can have a look at that and it's got all the times, um, which might be, we might shift those slightly, but it'll give you a good idea. You can find your workshop sessions on the back of your lanyard. Please make sure you attend the correct session. There'll be signs up and the staff can guide you with that. Um, and if you've got any questions about which one you've signed up for, in, just give us a shout and we'll help you out. Um, have a chat to any of the staff. We are, and it's hidden, but we're wearing these black lanyards here. So there's another three staff around who can give you a hand with anything that you need for today. So please do ask. And when you do move around, if you leave this for lunch or anything, please take your bag with you because they all look pretty similar. And um, we'd hate yours to get lost or confused or anything like that. So if you do go out, take that with you. And there's a few goodies in there. You might've checked out notebook book and pen, water bottle, and a few other bits and pieces. And then finally, at the end of the day, we've got our um, live performances and networking portion of the event. So please do stick around for that. It's gonna be really great. Uh, it's gonna be held on site here, so you don't need to go anywhere, just hike over to the other side of the building, this amazing building, I have to say. Um, and you know we can have a chat, there'll be some food and drinks and um, enjoy the performances for the day. So, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker and one of today's wonderful workshop mentors, Anna Laverty. Do you want to come? I'll, I'll read out your bio as your, as your, no, you'd rather. <laughs> Most people don't like it when their bios are written, um, read out in front of them. So award-winning producer, Anna Laverty has built an exceptional and ever-growing showreel of credits, solidifying her reputation as one of Australia's finest creative talents helming production on an impressive catalogue of releases across multiple genres. Anna is renowned for her ability to pull innovative tones and help a project realise its sonic potential. Please welcome Anna. Thanks so much Anna for being here today. And speaking with Anna today is Drew Goddard. Drew has been involved in the music industry for 20 years in a multitude of capacities, but predominantly as a guitarist, songwriter, co-producer for Perth's acclaimed progressive rock export carnival. Over the years, he is actively involved behind the scenes in the live arena, stage managing and site work at festivals, as well as driving and guitar teching for a plethora of national and international artists and recording and developing artists in his home studio. <laughs> Please welcome Drew Goddard. Thanks so much for joining us, Drew. All right. Thanks so much, Anna and Drew. I'll leave you with it. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Oh, I've got a microphone. Rookie error. Thanks to Neil. Thanks, Apra. Hello. Hi, Anna. Good Hello. to see you <laughs> in conversation. Um, yeah. Oh, I've got some questions for you. I'm looking forward to this. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, better get into it. We've only got 45 minutes. So how about we start with just a brief background. Um, we got a little bit from, uh, that was more of a bio, but um, a little bit about yourself, how you became interested in music um, and songwriting, and then more so the production side of it. Um, and then how it led to your current job when you realised it was your job. Um, yeah, is it a job? Is it a job? That's, that's really? a question in itself. Um, cool, so uh, I guess I got into this because I just always really loved music. I was um, very deeply affected by music in a way that I wasn't by anything else at all. So um, that's, that was the first clue. Um, you know, I, I remember feeling like I loved music way more than anybody else did and I thought that was kind of weird, but then now I know that that's an amazing thing, but at the time I thought it was a bit weird. Um, my dad also really loved music, so he had a lot of records um, and I just remember when I was about 14 um, reading the liner notes on records and always seeing a line that's, you know, it was like guitars by this dude vocals by this dude but it was always like produced and engineered by and it would have the name of someone and I was like that I think that's what I want to do because I don't want to be the performing person I hate I actually hate being on stage in front of people <laughs> so um yeah so there was that I just pretend you're not here it's fine um 
so um, I was like, I think I want to be that person. And then when I got to year 11 and 12 at high school and all my friends left and it was just me and the nerds left, which was great. Um, <laughs> I chose um, drama as one of my subjects and um, not because I wanted to act at all, but because I wanted to do, I knew that they had like a lighting board and a sound board. And I was like, I want to do that. So I spoke to the drama teacher and I said, is it okay if I don't act and I just do all the technical stuff? So the lighting show at our production of Annie was amazing. <laughs> Uh, and I did all the sound and all the rest of it and um, and I got an A in drama which is hilarious because I'm definitely like a C student for maths and, and all the rest of it but I but um, my drama teacher at that time said oh there's actually a really great uni in WA because I was I I'm English but I had moved to WA when I was a kid and um, they said there's actually a really great school here that you should go to it's called Whopper you should apply so I applied when I was in year 12 after two years of doing work experience anywhere I could where they had like a console or a board or whatever because I'd gone to the open day and the guy was like, you won't get in, you don't have any experience at life, you need to go and live a little bit. So anyway, I was like, I will prove you wrong. So I went and did all this work experience, I applied, I got in, I was very young, I was 17 and I went to Whopper and I did sound. There you go. Wow, that's is that a good answer. That to is your a great question? answer. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, all right. Here's a question: uh, How do you define the role of a producer in general, um, as it's known in the music industry? Um, does that differ for you? Um, um, your definition, um, and does that change? Um, and just to talk through people, the difference between like an engineer and a producer and, um, you know, some of the different hats you might find yourself wearing. Yes, I wear a lot of hats because budgets in the music industry are a lot smaller these days. So my definition of a producer is, um, okay, so when, okay, you're a songwriter, you write a bunch of songs and you're like, I don't, how do I get a record out of this? I don't know. You need to go and find someone who can help you with that stage, you know, from having written a song to having a song that you can send to the radio. So they come to me and they say, can you help me do this? And I can because I studied as a sound engineer at WAPA. So I studied for three years. I became a sound engineer and then I specialized in uh, studio production so you can be a sound engineer and work on the radio or or you know do this you know hand out microphones at events like there's lots of different sound engineers but I chose studio production so I went straight into working in recording studios where I um, uh, help people record their records so an engineer makes everything sound good a producer decides how that it's going to sound right how at the end they want it to sound and they know the steps to take from you playing an acoustic guitar in your bedroom to having a, a song that goes on the radio. I do both because in Australia budgets aren't huge and so usually you can pay for one person to help you and I do both of those things. Yeah. Okay. So producer, creative, engineer, technical is how I like to think of it. Excellent. There's also loads of different types of producer. So like, you, you know, someone will call themselves a producer if they just make beats on their computer. I yeah. call myself a producer. I'm a much more traditional type producer where I, um, have, I, I like, uh, have ideas about how I want a record to sound in the end. Okay. Yeah. Um, does that ever extend to um, working out the budget and that sort of thing yes. with, a, with a band? Yes, so part of the role of a producer is I always say it's um, delivering a record on time and in budget. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and so that's your job. Quite a few responsibilities Yeah, so there. someone comes to me and goes, I want to record this record, I want it to be so epic, I want it to sound like the most hugest record you've ever heard, I've got $5,000. You're like, well, I won't be hiring the Sydney Symphony for this one. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have, to, you have to make those decisions about what um, you're going to do. So for something like that, I'd be like, well, we can use a lot of synth strings for this one, you know, um, and try and emulate the Sydney Symphony. But yeah, so you just have to work out what budget you've got and what you can do with that. Really defines the project. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to go into a bit, bit more uh, in terms of that um, in a bit. But um, 
I thought I'd just ask for some of your inspirations um, oh. and oh God. maybe who you'd work with, dead or alive, if you, if you had the opportunity. Yeah, for sure. So I, yeah, I, do you, well, this is going to show my age, but when we used to have MySpace, you would put like, it, it asked for your three, like, you know, uh, I don't know what it was, heroes or inspirational people or something like that. And I, I remember I had like, um, three producers because I'm a total nerd um, and it was like George Martin and Nick Launay and um, uh, I can't remember and a couple of other uh, and another person but basically um, I got to work with Nick Launay on a record which was really amazing experience he didn't kind of disappoint um, yeah I don't know I'm just inspired by people who record music um, prioritizing feel as opposed to performance um, so I'd, I'd much prefer like at the end of a song I'll go like wow I really believed what you were saying then oh my god that guitar solo was perfect mm. yeah you, oh. you probably disagree <laughs> <but>. <laughs> yeah. no, so I yeah. won't be doing the next carnival record <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, all right, just on the George Martin thing, just to, yeah. have, you, have you heard producing the Beatles podcast, just as an aside, um, focusing on the George Martin uh, collaboration with the Beatles, if people don't know who George Martin is, he's, he's, uh, he did a lot of things, but he was most commonly known as the guy, that the fifth Beatle. Mm. I haven't listened to the podcast, but I... I watch I've watched Get Back four times. Oh, me too. Yeah, it goes for nine hours, but it's unbelievable. Get Back is a, the Beatles documentary, and I, I highly recommend that. Um, I've watched it four times too. Have and also, you? <laughs> it's exactly. so good. I had to do a talk on it, um, and I was so scared of all the Beatles nerds turning up and like going, "That's not right." John Lennon didn't wear that on that day, <laughs> you know. So I, I was really careful to like take notes about what what actually happened in this documentary but yeah. yeah but i think that's a great insight um into, into you know a process but it's there's so many things about the way that the the dynamics of the band and the producer and everything within that documentary which is produced by peter jackson too i think yeah. um just it just resonates with me and i'm like man we've i've been in that scenario and it's totally uh, it's a very good insight um I think if you want to know if you want to be a producer or not, you should watch that documentary. And if you can get through it without going, this is the most boring thing I've ever seen in my life, then maybe you could be a producer. <laughs> but I was watching it the whole time going, oh my God, yeah. this is unbelievable, which means I'm definitely doing the right thing with my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a good sign. <laughs> ba <-dum. laughs> Ah, it's one of those sort of days, eh? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, I want to get into some of the little bit of the technical technology sort of stuff and gear, um, especially um, how it's changed over the years um, and affected the way you write songs and the way you produce and, and your creative output. Um, but maybe can you talk us through like your first set up um, when you were starting um, and uh, anything, any sort of clues for um, maybe people looking to get into production or songwriters looking to, you know, DIY themselves. Um, I mean, I, I, I started, this is showing my age too, but my brother and I used to sit there with, you know, the dual tape deck and... Me too. Yeah, okay. When we figured out um, that you could plug a microphone in yeah. and you could hit play on one tape and then record on the other. Dude, and like, oh. yeah, we are from the same school. <laughs> okay. For sure. And then I, you know, I had a keyboard that, because I, I got taken to do piano lessons and my mum trying to save, you know, the interest in music, which was waning just to get me a keyboard. And then I was just playing the drums and then I sort of started doing there. And then I had a microphone and a sound card and then I realised I could record the snare drum out of there and, you know, um, did yeah. you have any sort of similar things when you were getting started, you know, just... I had exactly really... the same similar thing. We probably had the same tape deck. Um, it was, you know, it was one of those... I realised if I jammed down the button in a certain way, then I could do, like, two channels, or I could have two tapes playing at the same time and record another one, so I could, like, multi-track, so I could, like, 
do a guitar track and then I could do a vocal track on the top of it, which was the greatest thing ever. It was very early. Just, just quickly, does anyone not know what a cassette tape is here? <laughs> Come on, don't. Cap skids. Yeah, all right. Um, you get a cassette tape, just quickly. It's, um, it's, music used to be recorded on a medium, which is actually a, a, a reel of tape. Um, and then, this, then, then came CDs um, after that. Um, mini, now it's mini discs. Mini discs, sorry, yep. Oh no, beta, yeah. 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 But anyway, just to clear that up. Yeah, so that's what I used to do. And then um, I'm sort of, I started doing this weird thing with VCR tapes as well, like not, not um, yeah, yeah, not, us not using the vision so much, but just using the audio on that. And RCA cables were very convenient to be able to move around sound. Anyway, it was, it's all very nerdy, but anyway, basically you don't do that anymore. Um, I never had that thing where I had like a home studio at first because at that stage it was kind of not really accessible. Like financially, it was it would have been quite expensive to set up a home recording situation. So I went straight into assisting um, at studios or like um, or like going to rehearsal rooms with bands and recording them in that way. Um, I never really had any of my own gear until probably the last 10 years when I realised I could buy, or oh, maybe longer than that actually, but yeah, I could buy like a um, interface and mm -hmm. a, a laptop and have a microphone and headphones and be able to do pretty much anything with that setup. Awesome. Yeah. So how about the work experience? Um, oh yeah. When you started to, um, you know, go in and, and approach bands, um, which is one of my my question's here as well. Um, how did you go about approaching studios uh, for work experience and how did you go about approaching bands uh, and what do you look for in a band? What did you look for and what do you look for in a band? I basically went to as many shows as I possibly could. I went to ev whenever ever there was a show, I went to it. So when I was in Perth, when I was at uni, I would go to all, all the shows of bands that I liked and then I moved to London and I basically put on nights every Thursday in Soho and I saw like, I probably saw 25 bands a week when I was there. Um, probably, yeah, maybe more. And of those, I'd be like, you're really great, get talking to them. They didn't really have a lot of money to record, so I would do it for cheap because um, I just wanted the experience. And then eventually I was like, I really want to get in a good studio. I just need some studio hours. So I took my CV on my floppy disk down to the internet cafe <laughs> and I emailed all of the studios um, that I could find just from Googling them. And I asked if I could come and do work experience. Most of them never got back, but one of them did. And they said, we have a two week work experience program where you come in on this day and you leave on this day and the person before you shows you what to do. And it was basically like refilling the tea bags, washing the tea towels, making sure the studio was tidy, um, not talking to anyone and you know, pretty much that for two weeks and then you train the next person and you leave. On my second last day that I was there, a guy came in and he was like, what are you, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just cleaning this light switch. And he was like, well, that seems a bit rubbish. You know, I'll try and find something better to, you and I, to do. And I found out that he was the owner of the studio. He said he'd never walked in on someone actually proactively doing something they hadn't been told they had to do before. And so he got me to go in the studio and help a producer called Ben Hillier, who was packing up his studio to go to America for six weeks to do the Depeche Mode record and Ben was packing up his studio and could I help him put gear into um, crates and so that's what I was doing and I had this ingenious idea apparently of creating an inventory so basically writing down everything that he was taking with him so that he wouldn't leave anything there and he was like wow that's amazing do you want a job? <laughs> that's go. awesome. So I got a job assisting him as his assistant engineer. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Inventory. Yeah, and being yeah. a team player and just going, how can I be helpful in this dynamic? In this, in this yeah, situation? and we also had a really similar sense of humour, so that really helped. I think, like, if you because you because you work for such long hours, I think if you're working with someone, you have to get on. You know, like you have to be sort of similar personality. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so that that's that helped. As we say, and you know, or I say with a bunch of musicians, it's all about the hang. You know, it's all about the hang. It's all about yeah. the hang. You've got to be fun to hang with. Yeah, just keep keep the vibe high. Oh dear. Especially on those. Um, sometimes it doesn't it doesn't all go according to plan, but especially with the long hours, which I'd like to talk about and ways you navigate that as well, and switching on and off. Um, mm. But um, I, well, why don't we why don't we tackle that now then? Like um, like what, what's some of the longest sessions you've done, and oh. does time go out the window for you? How do you stay on time and on target? Um, and then how do you switch off when you need to switch off? Oh. Or are you um, still figuring that out like I am? Yeah, I'm still figuring that, cool. still figuring that out. But in terms of hours, I had to, a few years ago, I have kids now, so I really had to be like, I have to leave at a certain time because it's not fair um, that I'm, if I'm not home. So um, I, I, because I've been doing it for so long now, I have the experience of knowing how long I think things are going to take. So I have a plan in my head of how long we can spend on each thing. Um, sometimes I write it down. I used to write it down so that um, at any moment in time I could look at my watch and go, right, we should really be doing those guitar solos by now. We need to wrap up this bass yeah, take. It's first fundamentals right, right there. So, um, so I kind of have that plan in my head and um, we never really go, you know, it's part of the job is being on time. So um, we never really go over that and using your people skills to get people into the right frame of mind and prepared for their part is really important um, to keep things going, keep, keep things on time. What is the longest session I've done? I don't even want to answer that question because it's support act will not thank me. Um, <laughs> it's very, I, I used to work extremely long hours and I do remember there was a particular session where I worked. So I got there at nine in the morning, but the band didn't rock up till about three in the afternoon. And then they worked until 9.30 in the morning and then my next session was starting at 10. So I worked from nine in the morning until it got to about three the following day and I was so delirious that I bent down to pick up a cable and I head butted a pole and knocked myself out and mm. then they sent me home. <laughs> yeah. it can Sleep happen. deprivation is real. Yeah. yeah. And I just, I, I remember I regularly used to work 16 hour days um, when I was in London because backups would take like two hours. So everyone would go home and sleep and I was the assistant. So I would have to stay and wait for the backups. And that would be an additional two to three hours. And then I would get the night bus home and then I would get the bus back in in the morning, like three or four hours later and start again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just before you mentioned um, about people and kind of managing people as well as time. Yeah. Um, and I think a big part of producing or songwriting and the create, creative process is, um, yeah, people skills. And um, I guess for the producer, um, sort of being aware of the dynamics. Um, yes. And yeah, it's personalities, egos, shyness, um, you know, re resolving disputes, all yeah. the, these kind of things. How, how do you navigate that? Any any tips for um, anyone wanting to be or wanting to create collaboratively? Yeah, getting a read on dynamics pretty early on is really important. And I like to. I would never do that in the studio. I would always invite myself to pre-production, so a band rehearsal or something beforehand, so I can and and asking them to do certain things and seeing how people react to it. So, so they're playing a song that they've been playing for a long time, and suddenly I'm going to come in and I'm going to go. Can you play this three BPM faster? And can you cut out the kick drum in this section? And can you not play that guitar part? Because I just want to see how it sounds without it. And just watching how people <laughs> like explode <laughs> over that. Um, and then you know what personality types you're dealing with. Um, and then go, okay, no, it was fine how it was. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Lol. Um, yeah, Cheating. so that just just working out what you're dealing with pretty early on is really important. And then you can sort of, there's, there's always going to be egos. There's always a one big one, sometimes two, and that's hard to kind of navigate. And then there's always the people who don't get listened to because it's just too hard for them to have an opinion. So I always try to coax their opinion out of them as well, because often it's really valid. Producers often 
probably unwillingly become the, the band psychologist True. sometimes, you know. Sometimes I feel like I should have some sort of qualification because I'm making yeah. very, very uh, bold yeah. <laughs> uh, moves. I think there's a lot the of psych there's a big psych psychology, psychological element sure. to, to your job for sure. Um, yeah. My, my, one of my tricks actually is just killing people with kindness. I feel like you're never, ever going to get anywhere in a stuck dynamic by confronting someone um, or sort of questioning why they're doing something. My whole thing is like prove to them what you want them to do is going to be better mm -hmm. and, and make it their idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Interesting. Okay. Just like do everything you can to make them go, oh, how about we do it like this? And you go, great idea. <laughs> Let's do that. And yep. that's what you wanted, you know. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Um, all right, here's one. What makes a good song? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, look. You can take Th that. There's so no... There is no formula. And luckily for us, if there was a formula, we humans would not be making music anymore. It's just about something about a combination of all the things, you know, mm. you, wouldn't get, you wouldn't get a pass in science with that answer. But basically, we don't know because um, they've come up with all these algorithms for a computer to write the most perfect song and then you hear the song and go, that song really sucks. Mm -hmm. You just need people to, a combination of people, experiences, instruments, um, recording equipment, and then you get it and you go, that's a killer song. And you can't really define it and that's what makes it so exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. There's yeah. Still, still a lot of mystery for me too when it comes to songwriting. Um, yeah. Yeah. What, what about, um, say, uh, the, the initial stage of uh, songwriting um, oh, yeah. and, like, say, the blank page to the next part, like, a, like the initial idea, um, to, I guess, the arrangement um, and the structuring part of it. Um, how, how does that... Let's start from the start, so... Um. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different ways to start writing a song. Um, and honestly, like, for someone like me, I could procrastinate forever and just never write a song. But at some point, you just have to decide on a technique that you're going to use and just start doing it, and then you can change it. <laughs> you know, like, nothing is set in stone. So um, there, there are so many ways to start, but, you know, and I'm going to... I think I'm doing a workshop later, so, you know... I'll yeah, talk about that more in depth at the time, but a good way is to come up with like a song map where you, um, you do, so you don't write a verse and it has everything you wanted to say in the first verse and then you've got the rest of the song and you've got nothing else to say. Mm -hmm. So like spacing out those ideas over a whole song and then fleshing out the sections is a really cool technique. Okay, so then that's, that's you creating something from scratch. What if, um, mm. uh, how often do people bring in like just say like a voice memo on their phone. Or Always. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's mostly how I write with people. So I would never come, I would never go up to you and be like, Hey, I've written this really cool song. <laughs> you should use it in carnival. <laughs> right. I might even do anything. Yeah. Know. I just wouldn't do that. What it would be would be like the artist would come to me and say, I've got this idea. Let's try and finish it together. And then I would talk to them about what they're trying to do and we would finish the song together because okay. I'm not I'm not an, I'm not an artist in that way I don't I don't want to get up and tour the world singing my songs that's mm -hmm. not my jam well from a, a, a producer's um, point of view that is a songwriter what would your advice be to the actual songwriters that aren't producers themselves mm. uh, who are because you I've talked about you approaching other bands or what about uh, bands and artists approaching you um, what do you suggest, or or any producer really, if they like the sound of someone, how would you recommend they approach you? Um, any tips? Um, oh look, honestly, it's really funny. Like I get that question a lot. Like, how do I get to work with you know someone like you? And I don't know what people think of someone like me in term maybe just out of reach or unavailable or too busy or whatever it may be. Um, 
like, I, th I think a lot of people think I'm way more expensive than I actually am. Um, and I guess I would just say, just email the person. Like, I have a website. It has an email address to contact me. Like, just do that. Um, and, you know, I guess maybe sometimes, for, and this would have been me, like, too afraid to ask someone in case it's just out of my reach financially and then I'd be really embarrassed and I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, be, that would be weird. Um, but... I just think, you know, if you're writing good songs, producers want to work with you. So I wouldn't be afraid of that. Just um, just reach out and, and, and usually send a link to a demo is usually a good idea because we need to hear the music to know if we want to work on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, taking, taking bookings and all that sort of stuff, do you, uh, do you manage yourself or do you have someone doing bookings? Um, um, managing? I have a manager that I've had for over 10 years. Her name's Catherine Harrity. But um, I, she, Kath has never got me a job. She's never got me a gig. All my gigs come from word of mouth or, um, you know, me going to see a band and telling them I like them. Uh, or, or whatever, like it's pretty much word of mouth. That's how I get jobs. Um, but Kath's company, Catherine Harrity Management, they do all my, so they'll send out my invoices, they'll send out the contracts. So I have a contract with every artist I work with, which is really basic and it just protects everyone from, it lays out what the expectations are around credits, around fees, around payments and stuff like that. Um, which is, uh, I was, if you don't mind, um, just to, um, go into that part of it a little bit more because I think um, it's one of those things that really isn't spoken about much um, within the industry and through my experiences. Um, well, I mean, we've all heard about those people that get involved in, in, in a project and maybe they didn't know it was an awkward conversation to have or they didn't think it was the right time to talk about that sort of stuff before getting into a, a project. Yeah. Um, and then it ended up getting a bit messy later where there was some disagreement or you know um someone had a you know different idea of how much work they did or um so that's a the, polite way of putting it yeah the, the, the importance of uh, what is this something that you i mean now you, you answer my question that management sorts that for you but someone who doesn't have management um yeah any advice in terms of that um like conversations to have especially if it comes to co-writing something, um, because I know that there's some ideas that um, an app, this is probably down the APRA path as well, that I think in the past, if you've written the lyrics, um, then you, you know, for the, the, um, the APRA part of it, not the AMCOS uh, reproductive part, it's the, it's the um, uh, they're automatically um, due for 50% of the, the mechanical royalties or something where it's on, in our band, we've just made it 20% across the board, yeah. you know, just to make it easier. Even there's, some no, more work. there's no set way of doing it actually, which is, which is kind of com confusing for some people. Like you would think, um, yeah, 50% lyrics, 50% music is one way of doing it. But then equal splits across a band is another way of doing it for longevity. So like 20 years later, the band still exists because one guy isn't driving a Ferrari and the rest of you are driving a Datsun, you know, because <laughs> um, that will cause friction within the dynamic. Um, nothing wrong with Datsuns, by the way. Um, yeah, but uh, and then there's other ways of doing it, like Nashville splits, like whoever's in the room gets an equal cut or whatever. There's lots and lots of ways of doing it. And the best way to work out what the way you're doing it is, is to talk about it beforehand. Um, so even if you say, hey, we're in this room, there's three of us, it's going to be three way split. Is that cool with everyone? Um, or even if you say something like, should we work out songwriting at the end, depending on who writes what? Do you think having these conversations can affect the outcome in a, in a negative way um, or? Yeah, you know. but it's, for me, it's not as hurtful as like when you go in and you write a song with someone and then you don't talk about it and then you get an email from their management saying, oh, are you cool with 10%? <laughs> and you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I wrote 50% of that song. Yeah. You know, that's even more awkward. Um, and hurtful. Really, it really hurts me when that happens. And so I, I, I pr would prefer to have that super awkward conversation at the start. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. yeah um, I, also, just on that, so that's songwriting splits, but there's also um, producer credits. So in my contract, it's, it will say, depending on what the project is, uh, the liner notes must reflect um, Anna's work or contribution to the project, and it must read produced, engineered, and mixed by Anna Laverty at whatever studio. And it says it in bold, and that's what it has to say on the liner notes um, or in the credits. So like on Spotify, when you click on like produced by, it will have my name. Mm. Yeah. Yep. That's really important because there have been times where I've produced, recorded, and mixed a record, and um, they send me a copy, and it says produced by the band. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh dear, ouch, that hurt. Because it sort of takes away your, you, my whole creative output is production and it, they took that away from me. So it's very important to me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, as my manager would say, I enshrine it in contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe that's why the, the uh, conversation about defining the role of producer, um, you know, uh, in the in the in the front end, mm. might be good, or just in general. Yeah. Um, all right, um, we're getting a little bit short on time. I just thought, are you okay to take any questions? questions if there are questions, because yeah. I've got a few more if people don't. But I thought maybe we put it out to to you, Mob. Yeah. making a song sound as good as possible, right? Yeah. So if a songwriter has written their song and they've got a certain way that they know how they'd like that song to come through, yeah. and it differs from the producers and yeah. the engineers, and it's like, ah! And at the end of the, at the, end of the recording, the sound so it sounds completely different to what you felt you wanted it to yeah. do. So the, it's like trust. Yeah. You have to trust that these people have got your best interests at heart. Yeah. And I really struggle yeah. with finding that trust. The one, the, the one th way I would suggest that you can avoid that exact situation, because I, you have no idea how many people come to me and they say, I did this session with the Sky and it is, I, I hate it. I'm never going to release it. It's not, it's not what I wanted. And the one way I would suggest that you avoid that pitfall is pre-production. So before you go anywhere near a studio, you talk about what you want and you tell them what you want and you give them references to songs that you like that sound like what you want and you get on the same page about what you're aiming for. Because, um, yeah. and then the whole, it's communication the whole way along. You just, it, the artist can say to you like halfway through, oh, Thanks for producing up that beat. It's it's not doing it for me. It's not it's not going in the right direction. And then you can reassess what the vision is. Yeah. yeah. And I guess because songwriters often don't have much money, mm. and so it's like, uh, what's the cost of this going to be? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I quote, I quote everything. So like I, if an artist came to me and said, um, I want to work with you, um, but I have no idea how much it's going to cost, I would, I would say, I would write it all out like, um, you know, okay, we're doing five songs, so let's say there's going to be five days in the studio. The day rate is going to be this. We're going to be working between eight and ten hours because that's what I do now. I work between eight and ten hours a day. Um, uh, and so that equals this amount, pre-production pre is this amount per hour. We're going to be doing five hours of pre-production, so it'll be this much, um, you know, and I, I very clearly state what it's going to cost. And I do that because I never had any money and I know what it's like when you approach someone to work with. It's like a plumber. Like, you're not going to say to a plumber, come into my house and do what you want and send me a bill. You're going to be like, what is it going to cost to have water, right? That's, that's it. Um, and, and if it changes from that, you can go, well, I have a quote saying that that's what it's going to cost. So, yeah, I'm always really aware of being upfront about fees and stuff. Totally about communication. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, communication, I think that's a, that's a solid. I've just also found that 
different people have different ways of communicating, you know. Um, like some people, you know, like uh, you mentioned before, that, that uh, I know that that's just one member of my band, you know, that even if it's something, you know, it took me ages to realise, okay, just have that conversation with just him, you know. Let's take, okay. Oh, okay. And then, you know, um, you know, you've got to know their language. Um, and that's, you know, part like being in a band or especially a long-term one is like a marriage. It's like a marriage with five people. It is. So, yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, and that's where the trust part comes in. And trust, just, trust is important, like you said. Yeah, it is, it is. And the pre-production, just to yeah, that was another point I wanted to bring up too yeah. as well about the importance of pre-production. I think is um, is huge. But another yeah. question. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here. This is very very exciting. Um, I have two questions. If that's all right. Go nuts. Um, the, first, <laughs> the first one is, um, do you find yourself um, in recent years? working more on albums or singles in general? Yeah, good question. Um, it's funny because I get albums, but my manager said to me, I'm the only person that gets albums like in her roster. Like everyone else will get like a few songs at a time. But for some reason I get, I've been getting albums the last few years, which is kind of cool. I don't know if that's a COVID thing. Like, I, I don't know what it is, but I've been getting a lot of albums. Yeah, I used to get heaps of EPs because I work with indie bands from Melbourne. They're like, we've got four songs, that's it. Yeah, well, you know. Really from Melbourne, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, the second thing, I guess, is more of a personal question. Oh, yeah. Yourself, Look out. Um, is, yeah. is um, so if myself being an artist, um, and let's say I have a song or a few songs that I want to record and I need a producer, um, and I have, like, yourself, producer B and C, yep. and I've seen your guys work. Mm. Um, would you feel like, for example, more respected if I came to you saying, hey, look, I, I like the work. I trust what you do as a producer. Here are my songs. Just do your thing. Or like if I came like, hey, I want it this, I want it my way. You know, how oh. does that work for you ideally as a producer? Um, uh, it's not really work? about me, actually. So um, if you came to me and you were like, oh, um, I've got these songs. I would, I wouldn't want to just do my thing with it because I'm like, well, what do you want? <laughs> what do you want to sound like? I'd have to know what you want. Yeah, because right. um, yeah, otherwise I'd just, I don't know. That's songwriting to me. I'd basically be writing part of the song to yeah. finish it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cause, yeah. Yeah. Because before I've had um, where I've taken a song. I guess it's not fully fleshed out mm. and I've had a producer do his thing mm. and like I really appreciated that too because it's like oh I've seen your work so I guess yeah just collaborating. That's a collaboration to me that's more like a co-write thing and I, I, I have done that before but that's like we're writing a song together yeah. and we both like you know have an opinion on how it's going to sound in the end yeah cool. okay. yeah Thank you. yeah cool. Well, I think we might be out of time, so um, just a big round of applause for Anna, please. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, it was a pleasure.